Welcome to this Asia Global podcast brought to you by the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. I'm your host, Alejandro Reyes, the Institute's Director of Knowledge Dissemination. In our programs here in Hong Kong and online, and in the content that we produce, we focus on presenting Asian perspectives on global issues. This podcast is part of our Meet the Authors series, where we have a conversation with contributors to Asia Global Online and other publications of the Institute. Joining me now from Washington, D.C. is Elena Noor. Elena is Director, Political Security Affairs and Deputy Director of the Washington, D.C. office of the Asia Society Policy Institute, sometimes known as ASPI. A native of Malaysia, her work focuses on security developments in Southeast Asia, global governance and technology, and preventing countering violent extremism. Previously, Alina was associate professor at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and prior to that was director foreign policy and security studies at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, ISIS, in Malaysia. So Alina, welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me on here, Al. It's great to see you too. Great. Now, in your article, which is still trending on Asia Global Online, you wrote that the digitalization landscape in Southeast Asia is, in your words, a dizzyingly dynamic. Now, underpinned by ambitious top-down initiatives and with uh, market indicators to certify the buoyancy of this sector, um, the region's um, technology development is really on a high growth trajectory, propelled by, uh, again, as you put it very eloquently, like by every acronym and mythical creature in the startup lexicon. You argue that for the ASEAN community as a whole, however, to benefit from technology, economics should not be the whole, the sole determining driver. Rather, there are a few other imperatives that should be considered. So, so I guess, you know, as ASEAN tries to develop this sort of politically cohesive and socially responsible society, it really must here behind the economic lens and critically reflect on some fundamental concerns. So I'm wondering if we can start there and, and what are some of these fundamental concerns that um, ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries should look at? Yeah, so I, in my article, I list a number of them and um, these are areas that are not usually discussed um, at the ASEAN leaders level nor are they really discussed um, as part of this exuberance towards everything digital on the ground. Um, and as you mentioned, as I point out in my article, there is this exciting trifecta of government and private sector and the market coming together. But what's often lost in all this excitement um, are, and I point out in my article, three areas one of which has to do with the power and politics of technology. Um, and from that angle, I urge really readers and everybody um, looking into tech in Southeast Asia to really think about how technology and um, some of the geopolitics impacting technology will affect Southeast Asia in the near term, but also in the longer term. Um, in the near term, I think what we should think about is as we import some of these technologies, and Southeast Asia is still very much um, on the demand side rather than the supply side of technology. So as we import many of these technologies to improve our lives on the ground, we should really be thinking about what is being done with the data that's being constantly collected and extracted who the data is going to, how is it being monetized, um, and what other purposes might they be used for, especially if private sector companies are 
collaborating or sometimes colluding with more powerful state instruments. Um, and that's sort of the near term consideration. But in the longer term, we should also be thinking about what kind of say we have in the development of these technologies, um, in the construction of some of these algorithms that underpin the technologies, as well as um, in the design and construction of what these technologies will be used for. Because very often, uh, because they are imported models, the context of these technologies and how they're designed might not be the right or appropriate fit for the context of our very different societies in Southeast Asia. Um, and then finally, on, on that longer term point, one of the considerations that we really should bear in mind is how um, the geopolitics, as I mentioned, but also this rupture between the US and China now that is spilling most manifestly in the technological sphere will affect uh, the choices that we make in procuring or acquiring some of these technologies. A lot of Southeast Asian governments are agnostic um, as to which technologies they, they buy and which countries they buy from. And if there happens to be more of a division entrenched in the technological space between the US and China, then uh, there is a very real risk that governments and people in Southeast Asia will be impacted by some of these uh, divisions that we are now seeing between the US and China. Right. Now, let's try to break that down a little bit, um, uh, drill down a little bit. So uh, one key point you talked about, so, so um, the platforms and systems are uh, in Southeast Asia, are acquired mostly from abroad, the technology, um, rather than developed indigenously at scale. So can you give sort of concrete um, sense to our listeners about what you mean by that and what are the consequences of that? Um, because I think, you know, for users, they might see, well, you know, th this seems perfectly fine, but uh, what, what, what they use, the apps they use or the platforms they, they access, but what does it actually mean when you talk about this fact that it's uh, much of the technologies acquired from abroad, what are the consequences of that rather than you know, having um, this technology developed indigenously? Sure, um, so there are technologies that are developed locally, right? And I think maybe a good example would be some of these chatbots that we see when we interact with websites um, in, Thailand or the Philippines. Um, Lazada, for example, a huge marketing e-commerce site um, in, in Southeast Asia. They have chatbots to assist. Um, and those might be developed in some countries locally, or they might be trained and developed abroad, uh, whether in China or elsewhere, uh, because Lazada is, is um, uh, an Alibaba company. Um, but where I think the technologies at scale um, affect us most is probably, I think a really good example would be social media. Uh, you know, almost all of us use some kind of social media platform, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or, or even WeChat. Um, and these methods of communicating with our friends and families are not developed in the region and in Southeast Asia, they're developed elsewhere. If they're American companies, they probably have been developed in Silicon Valley um, or in um, somewhere on the East Coast of the United States. So when these technologies are deployed at scale, designed and deployed at scale, often the training uh, of the data sets to unleash the full potential of these social media platforms may not take into account uh, local context, local cultures adequately enough. And I think you see this most evidently with how some social media platforms struggle to take into account local languages or the nuances of some of, of our local dialects, for example. Um, and so that's what I meant by this distinction between locally developed technologies as well as imported technologies. Now, yet, you know, if you look at something like Facebook, say, uh, uh, I think I'm right in thinking that some Southeast Asian countries are actually among the most prolific uh, 
uh, users of Facebook, Indonesia, the Philippines, places like that. Uh, and even I think um, uh, Twitter uh, is, is the same thing. So, so what does that actually mean in, in the sense of, um, um, does it even make sense for uh, indigenous platforms to even try to compete with that kind of muscle um, that, as you say, may not actually take into account the, the um, cultures and the, 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 the thinking in this part of the world, but in Southeast Asia, but, but Southeast Asians seem perfectly comfortable uh, with, with those platforms. Yeah, and um, you know, I think part of it is this lack of awareness about what is being done with our data. We're, we're only too happy to use these platforms to communicate, but there isn't a deeper consideration of what is being done when we use these platforms. Um, where is our data going to? How is it being used? How is it being monetized? Um, and you know, there are people who look into this very, very closely, um, experts like I, I mentioned in my article, Shoshana Zuboff, as well as um, Ulysses Mejias and Nick Caudry, who've done a lot of work on this idea of surveillance capitalism and basically the commercialization of us and the data that we put out there willingly because of these terms of service and, and terms of contract. Um, that we, you know, we usually just check the box and get on with it when we sign up for these services. Um, so yeah, we, we are huge users of social media, but um, the economies of scale, as you point out, Al, simply don't allow for us to maybe develop our own indigenous platforms, not to, not to that scale at least. Um, so I think what needs to be done, first of all, is to have this realization of uh, the questions surrounding our data. And secondly, the regulations that we might impose in our own countries to try to take back some of that control from some of these big tech companies. Right, now, so you, you, you now bring up the issue of, of some kind of governance um, to the, that might uh, look into the issue or address the issues of transparency and accountability. So. Um, your article was actually a curtain raiser to this ASEAN, inaugural ASEAN digital ministers meeting. Um, was that uh, uh, the beginning of, of, of a, a real discussion on uh, these issues? Uh, what came out of that meeting? Well, you know, the meeting um, did not really address the issues that I brought up. And I'm not surprised that it didn't because some of these issues are quite sensitive. And we all know that ASEAN meetings tend to shy away from the controversial and sensitive. Uh, what that meeting did do was discuss kind of more of the same, which is good from an economic standpoint, because uh, as I point out in my article, Digital technologies are mainly used to drive economy and uh, developmental priorities in the region. So the, the meetings um, outcome, there was a, a joint media statement that was released, talk more about cross-border data flows, um, a digital data governance framework, uh, personal data protection, all of which are key to anchoring a digital economy, but they don't really address these big security or more strategic issues related to the, the geopolitics of technology and um, at the ground level, again, you know, this, this issue of algorithmic or data governance on an individual or collective basis. Right, now, interesting. So, so in that sense, um, can we ever expect ASEAN to, to grapple with these issues that, that I mean, clearly require some addressing. As you say, uh, the track record of ASEAN is to perhaps avoid these more sticky uh, challenges. Uh, I think part of it, part of the, the, the stickiness has to do with the structure, right? So we have the three pillars. We do not have a fourth pillar that addresses issues that cuts across all three pillars. Um, and Perhaps in the future, there might be a separate forum that can collectively address these cross-cutting issues. 
Um, but right now, because the issue of technology cuts across the, the economic, political, as well as sociocultural community pillars, uh, they're addressed inadequately in every single one of those pillars. And so the primary um, driver of these discussions have really been done by the digital ministers. So that was sort of ASEAN's compromise, because in the past it was done by the you know, information and telecommunications ministers, um, addressed also by ASEAN's economic ministers from a digital economy standpoint. Uh, but framing this as kind of a, a digital issue was I think ASEAN's not to, yes, this cuts across all three pillars, but uh, can let's park it somewhere in between. And so the short answer is probably not in the near future where we expect us to address these big difficult issues. Um, but, you know, in, in ASEAN always acts in small increments. So maybe this is one of those progressive steps that we can applaud, I suppose. This is a kind of wink, wink sort of thing, right? Um, in a way. Uh, now, I mean, do you think that there's, that ASEAN at all draws any inspiration from say what the EU has been doing? Which of course, I think the EU has been the most proactive of the regional groups that uh, to look at these issues. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly on, on privacy and data protection. Um, but I think ASEAN is not quite ready to take the, the leap to those GDPR standards, for example. Um, there's a lot of harmonization that needs to be done among ASEAN countries. And every ASEAN country is at a different level in terms of data protection and even prioritization of the issue. So uh, we're still a long way off, but certainly there are examples that we can draw from in order to create our own um, set of governance structures that will work for us regionally. So that brings into relief this issue about, okay, so we have the ASEAN economic community, but how, how authentic it is, is it really, right? And, 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 and how, how deep is the integration in reality, right? I mean, I think that, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Right. This is a persistent question for ASEAN. It is, but on the bright side, you know, the ASEAN economic community is probably a lot more integrated than the political security community. Ah, right. Well, that's, of course, an interesting question. So it, 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 it brings up what you were talking about, the, the, the great power um, conflicts, if you will, or the US-China you know, overlaying all this technology discussion you can't avoid it, right? The US-China um, uh, strategic competition that's really focused in many ways on technology. Uh, I wonder if you can drill down a bit. You know, how, how is it affecting you know, where ASEAN goes in terms of its own technology development? Um, let me back up a little by contextualizing it in um, the ASEAN Digital Ministers meeting that we were just talking about a few minutes ago. So if you take a look at the joint media statement that came out as a way, it was just classic ASEAN, right? Um, so ASEAN goes through a list of all the cooperative initiatives it's done with almost every single ASEAN dialogue partner. So as not to alienate anyone and to include everyone. Um, and so it talks about cooperation with Japan and South Korea and the US and the EU and China. Um, and so I think with this geopolitical split uh, that has spilled over to the technological sphere, um, the, the issues are complicated because they affect uh, supply chain logistics and reliability, but they also affect some of the critical infrastructure that um, ASEAN member countries are laying down as part of um, its ASEAN connectivity initiative. So for example, we have the ASEAN power grid um, that will go across borders and that will have a digital component, obviously, in operations. If we think into the future, we think about all these different parts um, of systems and networks that we're going to be buying from our different dialogue partners. If there is going to be a complete decoupling of technology in terms of um, supply chains and vendors, um, how will that affect Southeast Asian countries in their decision-making about things that they've already bought, but also 
things that they will be buying later on in the future to uh, realize this connectivity goal that the grouping and the region has for you know, the next 20, 25, 50 years. There is no easy answer because ideally we would get the parts and, and systems and supplies from the best or from the best deals that are offered to us. But every nation is going to make its own decisions um, for its own borders. Um, and so how you piece these different parts and systems together, how are they going to be interoperable, whether they are going to be interoperable in the event of decoupling, these are all questions that need to be considered by every single ASEAN member country. Interesting, because, of course, you know, if you bring up the issue of decoupling, right, um, in some ways, decoupling has given some advantages to certain ASEAN alternatives to China, if I can put it that way. I mean, economies like Vietnam, in particular, uh, Indonesia, I mean, they, they benefited from that kind of diversification of trade because of the US and China friction. Um, but in technology, the decoupling may actually have some really detrimental effects, potentially, that, 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 that may be uh, the kind of collateral damage from this sort of great power competition. So, so um, I mean, I guess it's a matter of balance, right? How do you, how, uh, 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 for ASEAN, uh, trying to navigate this becomes really even more complicated. Right, and, and potentially it throws a huge wrench in the digitalization world, right? Um, all the ASEAN, almost all the ASEAN countries have essentially pinned their development and economic plans on digitalization. And if there is going to be a decoupling, if uh, chips or semiconductors are not going to be available to piece things together because of uh, export controls or other trade barriers, um, then it is going to be a hindrance to the achievement of these connectivity aspirations. In which case, ASEAN countries are confronted with what they've been complaining about is we don't want to choose. We don't want to make a choice, uh, right? And, and right. But unfortunately, right. that may indeed be where what, what will have to happen. Yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> and, and I think ASEAN has agency in trying to, obviously, interest, but also agency in ensuring that that doesn't happen. Right. So, so this comes again now to the, a question that um, is maybe more current in the, I mean, really current, is, is this issue of the quad, right? Because um, uh, we just had uh, last week the, the first summit of the quad convened by President Biden. It was done virtually. Um, now Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. And among the issues that they did talk about were supply chains and um, cybersecurity and uh, basically uh, technology issues, um, which again strike me as the areas of decoupling. I mean, they also talked about COVID and climate change, which might be areas where they need, or there would have to be cooperation with China. So, so it was kind of 50-50 split there in terms of let's follow a decoupling agenda versus let's follow a corporate uh, cooperation agenda. Um, I'm wondering what you think about that because they made a big point, the leaders of saying that they're reaching out, they're going to include ASEAN, Southeast Asia. But the quad in and of itself suggests a kind of um, shift away from recognition of ASEAN centrality in all of this. Yeah, and I think uh, you know some commentators have said that the statement released by the leaders show them almost falling over themselves to include and uh, appease uh, watch ASEAN watches particularly that there will be this respect for and commitment to ASEAN centrality, but what does that really mean, right, in practice, uh, especially as you point out, there are some areas where there might need to be cooperation with China, um, and China was not really mentioned in the, in the statement, summit statement at all, which uh, was 
both deliberate and quite, I think, um, a bit of a genius touch there um, in order to pacify um, you know, qualms and doubts about the true intentions of the Quad. So I think yeah, stylistically, we, we see a, a bit of a shift towards this commitment to multilateralism. Um, but I think in substance, we still have to wait and see what uh, a commitment to ASEAN centrality really means. Right. Now, I'm wondering if um, we can just talk a little bit about cybersecurity then, because I know that that's an area that you uh, also done quite a lot of research. In fact, you wrote an article earlier uh, for Asia Global Online on the issue. Um, and you talk, uh, I mean, on the governance on, 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 on these issues, because that, that, that takes us into maybe a different level. You're talking about um, the security of data and all of that sort of thing, um, because this is really, I mean, it's a global concern and, and not necessarily just sort of a regional concern. Um, where are we at in terms of cybersecurity in the region, uh, particularly, again, with the overlay of the U.S.-China uh, strategic competition? Well, the good news is that just last week, late last week, Friday last week, in fact, um, there was a consensus adoption of a report um, by the U.N. Open-Ended Working Group, which is a parallel track to the traditional UN group of governmental experts that um, has convened since 2004. So the OEWG, which was really a Russian-led initiative in its conception, um, is more inclusive and it brought together not only uh, multilateral governments, but also multi-stakeholders. Um, so you had civil society and businesses and, and government sitting in the same room talking about these same issues, but from very different angles. And so what came out of that process was a report that was adopted by everyone. So that, that's the good news. Regionally, I think there's also been good news in that um, Southeast Asia, really under the leadership of Singapore, has advanced its uh, norms game um, in that not only has it begun to adopt 11, the 11th 11 set of norms that was also again universally agreed to um, that, and these norms were produced and deliberated on by a UN group of governmental expert. Um, so ASEAN decided, yes, we will adopt in principle these 11 norms, but we will also implement them. And this is a huge step for ASEAN, right? So we talked about the glacial pace at which ASEAN moves. And, and I think this is really a huge step. So regionally, we're off to a good start. But there are, again, big questions that remain. You know, how do you, for example, put into practice this adherence to international law and cyberspace that everyone agrees to and talks about, but no one really can quite figure out what it means in practice in specific instances, for example. And, and this is a huge debate that is still ongoing um, right now. Right. Now, um, it shouldn't, um, people shouldn't miss the fact that uh, in all of this during the pandemic, um, we've had uh, the um, conclusion of the negotiations for the RCEP, for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is really kind of Everyone talks about it being China-led, but it's really ASEAN that's at the core of it because you have all the ASEAN countries in it and China was in some ways guiding the, the, the negotiations and it's been uh, concluded and you know biggest trade arrangement in the world, all that sort of thing. Um, is there anything in RCEP that covers these issues, the technology, um, cyberspace and, and things like that, because of course that's been in some ways the elusive um, area for the global multilateral uh, framework. Uh, that the, the complaint about WATO that they they haven't been able to tackle technology, cyberspace, uh, internet issues. Um, does RCEP have any? Um, uh, does RCEP factor in any of these issues? Yeah, I believe there is a consideration of 
the new economy in, in the RCEP agreement. But um, you know, RCEP is often uh, often uh, compared to the CPTPP, which is a kind of it's sold as a highest standard trade agreement, right? Um, and so I think the chapter on digital economy in RCEP doesn't quite go into as much detail as uh, some would like, um, but it, it is a, a beginning step. And I think once that baseline agreement um, can, can be made as it has been done, then we can begin to build on that. And, and separately, I know that there are economies like Singapore that have begun embarking on bilaterals or you know, mini plurilaterals in terms of the digital economy and going more into higher quality um, standards type of agreement. And so again, this is part of uh, the region's incremental approach to something that's still quite new. Do you think that ASEAN has enough muscle to set standards or to demand certain standards? I mean, I mean given your, we're talking about a 700 million um, people kind of market, a 700 million market. Um, is that enough? I mean, is, is ASEAN a, a player, enough of a player in, in the, land, the tech landscape to, to be important? I think we can be, and sometimes I think it's a matter not just of capability, but we also sometimes don't give enough, don't give ourselves enough credit in our own agency. And so perhaps what is also missing is this ingredient of confidence in ourselves in order to uh, negotiate terms that are more amenable to us. Because when we do, as we have done, like countries like Indonesia, um, Vietnam and Malaysia kind of push back on some of these uh, data localization requirements or, or requiring data localization terms. Uh, it's not been met very favorably by countries in, like the US, for example, it's seen as a restraint on the liberalization of digital trade. Uh, but you know, we all have our own interests to watch out for. And if I think we can, again, this is part of the constant ASEAN conundrum, right? If we can get our act together as a region and negotiate on block, um, harmonize our interests, then perhaps we'll uh, actually move the needle in our favor. Right. Now, this brings me to then the question because you're sitting in Washington and of course uh, the fashion these days is to talk not of Asia Pacific, but of Indo-Pacific. And um, so I'm wondering, how do you see the Indo-Pacific kind of framework that seems to be evolving? I mean, even now European countries are presenting their Indo-Pacific strategies and um, uh, ASEAN has its own Indo-Pacific outlook. Um, do you see Indo-Pacific as useful in terms of uh, supporting ASEAN centrality, supporting sort of the ASEAN ability to do as you were talking about, to, to maybe be a bit more confident in, 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 in determining the direction of all of these different issues in the region. I mean, personally, I'm a fan of the Asia Pacific, um, but I can understand the rationale of uh, the Indo-Pacific construct. Uh, and I think the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific was very carefully crafted in its language. It wasn't uh, an outright um, confirmation of the Indo-Pacific uh, concept. It was mainly ASEAN's approach to an outlook. It was exactly that, right? ASEAN, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So it was a nod to the Indo-Pacific construct without necessarily, um, you know, affirming it. So I, I think I, I'm in that camp as well. Well, I mean, I think that you, you use the word outlook, right? I mean, if as in, then then it's out, right? I mean, it means you're out <laughs> looking in, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm that's just. I, mean, I, I think the semantics of it may be debatable, but it just. <laughs> uh, it, 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 I even it, thought of that, but that's a really good point. I mean, I think that's, in my mind, that was the genius of that document. But uh, any, anyway, um, uh, you know, let, let's talk about your 
um, how should I say, journey from being in ASEAN at ISIS in Malaysia, which is a fantastic organization. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's truly uh, uh, one of the sort of leading, one of the leading think tanks uh, in Southeast Asia, if not the world, um, at, at least for the regional issues. And then you went to uh, Hawaii and, uh, and now you're uh, ensconced uh, in the belly of the beast, as it were, right in uh, Washington, DC. Tell us a bit about that journey because it's uh, quite an interesting one that happened quite quickly, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I treated, um, as I say, sea for the swamp, right? right. Um, <laughs> so yes, I, I, I spent most of my career in, in KL uh, working at ISIS Malaysia. And then I moved to Hawaii, where I was with the Asia Pacific Center of Security Studies, as you um, remarked in your introduction. Um, and I was there for about two years. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a different career choice for me. And I thought I'd try it out for a while. Um, and then decided that I actually missed the think tank circuit quite a lot. And so uh, then I found myself back in Washington at um, ASPE now. So I'm actually really excited to be back among fellow think tankers. Um, and as a nod to your, to the Canadian side of you, Al, I am also affiliated with the Asia Pacific Foundation right. Canada. I noticed that, right? I was very envious. Uh, you, you, you got I got in there. It's like, so it made me think, uh, is Alina a, a closet Canadian? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> of course, I mean, we met, we met in the UK. So, I mean, you're really uh, 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 in many different places. So, well, as are you since we met in the UK. Right, exactly. Well, I, I'm as guilty as anyone, I suppose. Um, uh, now, um, uh, speaking of, you know, erstwhile traveler, previous travels. Of course, nobody's traveling nowadays, right? And that's why we're here online. Uh, so tell us a bit about the situation in Washington, uh, not just out of the pandemic, but also, uh, you know, with this new administration, what, what, what's the vibe that you're getting? Depends who you speak to, right? So um, I think if you're speaking to a Trump supporter, then maybe you get a less excited response. But uh, generally, I think there is a lot of enthusiasm for this new administration, uh, some wariness about whether there will be actual change in substance, particularly, I think, if you're Southeast Asian like me and you are wondering what the China approach will be, uh, substantively, I don't think there will be much difference between the previous administration and this administration. Um, only the approach will be slightly different. So I think while there is some optimism and positivity about the return of America to multilateralism and to diplomacy as we always knew it, um, the, in, in some ways there will be more of the same, particularly as I mentioned, in uh, the US's policy towards China. So as, as a concerned Southeast Asian, not wanting to be caught in the middle, um, that's something that I'm looking out for. Any thoughts about the uh, this week's um, meetings in Alaska or? Um, um, you know, all right? I've heard is, is that, that it will be business, it will just be business, they won't even be dining together, and um, some very strong signals will be sent that uh, the U.S. will not stand for, um, from its perspective, Chinese bullying of its allies, uh, particularly Australia. And so I think while there is this mini attempt at some level of rapprochement, uh, the, the strong signaling will be that we will not put up with any nonsense. Right. from the US to, to China. Now tell us a bit about the pandemic situation that you're encountering how, how, you know, and, and how you've been faring, uh, you and your family have been faring in the pandemic, both you know, family Malaysia or uh, you know, your, yourself in, um, in DC, uh, what's going on? Yeah, it's been tough because I haven't been able to return to family in Malaysia for more than a year now. Um, but myself, I, I always only half jokingly say I found my in a hermit during this pandemic. And I've actually relished being ensconced at home. Um, the vaccination rollout 
program here has been, as I understand it, progressing quite well. Um, so I guess America is, is catching up in terms of uh, alleviating the, the effects of COVID. Um, but other than that, I think it depends where you are in the country. Some places never really shut down, never really made mask wearing mandatory. Uh, but here in the Metro DC area, there are people who, who mask up. But of course, now the, the new climate of fear among Asians is you know, this anti-Asian sentiment that uh, is unfortunately turning very ugly. Right, now, um, and, and how is it in Malaysia from your perspective? Um... And, and, and knowing your relatives, uh, how they're doing? Um, it's not great. Um, obviously, the, uh, the government there has decided that it needs to impose a state of emergency, um, ostensibly to control the pandemic. But uh, more cynical watchers think that uh, that's a result of inefficiency and insecurity. Um, the numbers are still around the hovering at around the five figure mark daily, which is pretty bad, I think, because we were doing quite well in the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, but uh, it's all relative and the numbers were a lot scarier last month or so. And so they've come down a bit, but still, like I said, around the five figure mark on a daily basis. Right. Now, uh uh, thanks very much. You're, 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 you've been so generous with your time, Lena. Let, let, let's close by. I just wanted to ask you about, well, you know, what 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 research work are you doing now? What's sort of your current uh, focus? I mean, we've talked about technology, cybersecurity. Is there anything particular now that you're um, you're focused on? Yeah, I'm working on a couple more projects related to technology in Southeast Asia, particularly with an eye on smart cities in in um, Southeast Asia and the implications of those smart cities. Um, I'm also looking at uh, mapping out cyber operations in the region over the past decade or so, tracking some trends related to that. Uh, but I have a, also a light-hearted project that's looking at pop culture consumption in Southeast Asia, particularly from Northeast Asian countries like Korea, obviously, but also Japan, um, and trying to understand the implications of intra-Asian relations um, based on these pop culture trend lines. Well, that sounds fascinating. That sounds like a, a, a real kind of popular book uh, in the offing right there. Um, yeah. I'm wondering actually, you, 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 so you, you, you mentioned um, uh, some of the uh, um, uh, pop culture uh, trends. Uh, uh, do you have any, I mean, as, as someone who uh, grew up in Malaysia, uh, were, did, were you, influenced by any of these sort of pop culture trends? Do you have any favorites? <laughs> I, I'm going to date myself here, but I grew up watching this Japanese drama series called Oshin. I don't know if you oh, ever... I, yeah. Came across it. <laughs> yeah, so that was my introduction to um, Northeast Asian pop culture. Uh, far cry from, you know, the bands of BTS and Blackpink these days. No, well, uh, I think, well, I for one am far too removed from those uh, phenomena uh, right now. But anyway, um, Elena, it's been such a pleasure to catch up with you and to have a conversation about technology. I mean, I, I think going forward this, uh, you know, if you think about what they say, data is the new gold and, you know, it's all about digitalization and technological development. Uh, going forward uh, for whatever issue uh, we're discussing, these are very important issues. And, and indeed, I think, you know, Southeast Asia can't be left behind. So it's wonderful to get your insights. Uh, so let me commend um, our listeners uh, to uh, Elena's articles on Asia Global Online. Come to the Asia Global Online website, the Asia Global Institute website, sign up for our newsletter and the digital journal and please follow us on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, you know the drill. And um, thank you again, Elena. It's wonderful to catch up with you. I hope at some point we see each other catch up in person. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Great. Take care.